Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. In addition to Pyle and me, there are four other women who are your hosts this evening. There's Nina, Shuli, Anjali, and Ritu, and all six of us join ourselves in welcoming you here today. You know, as Pyle said, we've uh, been in Gurgaon now for a year, and it's been a really heartening and very enlightening experience. This is our first evening here, and we're delighted to be sharing it with you. But I very quickly want to tell you a little bit about Algebra and why we started it. We had this sense that at a time when the world is full of rage and noise, we wanted to create a space, a continuous space in the city where there would be dialogue, a possibility of exchanging ideas, challenging our perspectives, and also to build a kind of community of the curious and the engaged, a fellowship of people who want to engage with society. And I think we've had a taste of that because in Gurgaon we do an event every 10 days and we have almost 350 very eclectic people joining us. The other thing is that, you know, just this evening I got a call from Vidya saying, Shoma, what is it that you're really going to be talking to me about because I'm terrified of the name algebra. I know nothing about math or philosophy or astrophysics. And I reassured her that the landscape of the conversation would be much the same because the reason we picked the word algebra is that it has a wonderful meaning and I think something that society needs today. It means the science of restoration and balance. So a lot of the conversations we have at Algebra are driven by that intent, not for combative, contrarian, sensational conversations, but a conversation often between adversaries, but which will create the opportunity for understanding empathy and the possibility of a presumed credibility even with those who you disagree with. And just one other note is that we have this emblem of the dragonfly, which also means the power of intellectual and emotional transformation rather than the pulverizing force of loud voices and uh, violence, physical violence. So to celebrate really the power of the mind and the heart, we're all gathered here today, and no one better to really embody that than our first speaker. All of you know Abhinav Bindra as the first Indian who won the solo gold uh, medal at the Olympics. But that's a very, very anodyne description of a man whose personal journey over 22 years is really, and I don't say this as a kind of hyperbole, is possibly the most humbling and awe-inspiring journey that anyone could take. We all know about the world of sports. It is imbued with the idea of spectacle, of cheering crowds, of large money, of obsession. But to be an Olympic level shooter is the most lonely and intense pursuit of excellence that it is possible perhaps for a human being to undertake. Abhinav Bindra in effect spent 22 years trying to shoot the eye of the eye of the eye. At that level, it's not enough to shoot the bullseye. You have to obliterate the difference between you and the next person by 0.5 millimeter, the breadth of one human hair. And that is really what Abhinav has been doing for 22 years. It is, as I said, a conversation with the self. It is a pursuit of excellence that has no rationale beyond the fact that you believe in it. And in many ways, when you hear his story, I've used this phrase before, but to me, it is almost a kind of monastic pursuit it is the search for human excellence at its most sublime and its most solipsistic. And Abhinav Bindra today stands before us a kind of embodiment of a work ethic, which if any of us could have a kernel of in our lives, I'm certain our country would change overnight. So ladies and gentlemen, to hear both the science, the obsession and the redemption of being an Olympic gold medalist, a shooter, please welcome Abhinav Bindra. Abhinav, uh, thank you very much for joining us. He flew back from Bangalore today to be with us. Abhinav, I haven't even begun to uh, really describe, as I said, the kind of almost madness of wanting to be a shooter. I'm not sure how many people in the audience also have thought about what it takes to be a shooter. So before we kind of plunge into your personal journey, would you explain a little bit of the irrational, uh, irrationality involved in trying to be a shooter what does it take? What is the science around it? Uh, what is the expertise that is needed to be a shooter? 
So it's a little difficult to explain the whole thing, but I'll start off by telling you why I picked shooting as a sport. Um, as a tw I started when I was 12 or 13 years old. At that time of my life, I hated sport. Uh, the only thing I was a champion was that I was bad was to miss physical education. Can all of you hear him at the back? Can all of you hear him? Yes. Okay. I was a champion at missing uh, physical education classes at school, and that was my biggest talent that I had. So one day I went to uh, my first coach, and uh, I went to shoot, and I really liked it. I liked it because to be successful in shooting, I had to stand still. So that was a good start I had. Uh, that, that's the real reason why I started. Uh, but I got addicted to it. I uh, um, I wanted to get better at it. It's a very addictive sort of uh, sport. It's a very feel-oriented sport. Uh, it's a battle within your own self. You're competing, yes, against uh, other people, but you're really competing against your own self. And uh, that was really interesting for me. It's a battle to be the best that you can be, uh, shot after shot after shot. Uh, there is no... Um, there was no finish line to greatness in my sport, and uh, that's what kept me going for 22 years. So, Avinav, uh, you know, I'll, I'll quickly share with the audience that we've been con conjecturing, but uh, I think he shot over four million shots in his life to arrive at that one moment of perfection that won him the gold medal. But, um, Abhinav, before again we get into the mechanics of the sport, what is the quality, the trait that you most needed to be able to walk this journey? Oh, that's a tough one because I was not talented. I was this fat boy who couldn't move, who couldn't do anything. I had no coordination. I had no balance. But uh, I had one thing, and my heart, my talent lay in was to work hard. That was my talent. So I, I just worked hard. I persevered, and uh, I struggled. And I, 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 I liked the struggle. It, it sounds ridiculous, but uh, I was just addicted to the struggle. I was addicted to the suffering of the, of suffering every single day and trying to be the best that I could be every single day and uh, yeah you you described my sport as lonely it wasn't lonely because i always had self doubt and anxiety as my faithful companions through the 22 years so i wasn't all alone so that was the battle that i had so uh, abhinav describe a little bit as i said at least until i encountered your book i had absolutely no understanding i thought you pick up a gun and you shoot and you're generally a good shooter and that's what it takes would you share with the audience the precision required to be an Olympic level shooter. Explain some of the mechanics of what's involved in that. Well, it's, firstly, the target's bloody small. <laughs> uh, if you just, uh, it's, the target's a dot. It's like if you take a pen, or the tip of a pen and make a dot, that's the target what you're aiming for 10 meters away. Um, it requires high degree of precision. I think the biggest challenge in my sport is, is you, it's not the most natural of sports. The human body is built to move. Uh, and I tried to do something which was completely contrary. I tried to stand still. Um, and it's funny because uh, I gave up last year. Uh, I retired last year and I've actually lost weight because now I don't stand still for a living. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it, was, it, was, it was intense. It was very, very intense. Um, I worked in a holistic manner. It was about... Uh, being the best I could be technically, it was about physical preparation. The fat boy had to get fit. That was a big challenge. Um, you had to be mentally up there. You had to, I had to encounter and, and, and find ways to uh, navigate all the self-doubt and the pressure that I continuously put on, put on myself. Uh, I had a kind of a perfectionist attitude, which helped me in many ways. But uh, chasing perfection is like chasing an untamable beast. Uh, it has its pluses. It also has, has its negatives. And that, to me, that was one of my biggest challenges that I had to overcome. And uh, I was never satisfied. And I was, uh, I was always struggling to, um, uh, to gain any sense of confidence because I was always I was a very critical person. I was always looking. The first thing that came up was, how can I do this better? So I was never satisfied. And that helped me in many ways. But it was also uh, a kind of a disadvantage because in sport, it's nicer to be positive, and it's nicer to have a little bit of self-belief, which I certainly didn't. So Abhinav is not entirely sharing, forgive me my passion and enthusiasm about his sport, but he's not entirely sharing, as I said, the sheer 
incredulity of what they have to do. So let me quickly tell you that before I question him I'm further. a shooting expert now. <laughs> Who, me? Yeah. You've had this incredible impact on my life. You know, I'm making my sons read your book like a Bible. You know? uh, but really what it involves, as I said, he said it's, it's a tiny dot, but it's uh, 10 meters away. And uh, as Abhinav said, you have to still your mind, you have to still your body. Everything that he was doing was to make himself fit, which would really increase the adrenaline in his body. But he had to stay still. And I found it fascinating that that distinction between failure and success could be just the angle of the hip, could be just the irregular breathing. Uh, he spent almost a year perfecting, just keeping his fingers on the trigger for two seconds more than his natural instinct was. Uh, he, he increased the sole of his shoe by one millimeter because that's what was the distinction between success and failure. Uh, and that is, you know, the alignment and all of that. So it's really, to read that book is to understand what pursuit of excellence means. So having done a bit of your work for you, Abhinav, tell me, what is the extreme extremities that you went to, to acquire both the psychological temperament and the physical expertise uh, to become the medalist? I think whoever goes to an Olympic Games is great. You know, the, you can't just walk into an Olympic Games, you have to earn it and you have to, qualify for the games and just qualifying for the games is a huge achievement. But when you actually get there, it's the 1% where what makes all the difference. And I was a person who always looked, no, no detail was small enough for me to ignore. So I went into everything like my shoes, my, 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 my shooting equipment, uh, my rifle had to be absolutely aligned. For example, I'll give you an example, before the Beijing Olympics, uh, the Chinese manufactured the best ammunition but they, they did not sell it to anybody. I managed to smuggle some of it, and I think that was a bigger achievement than, my own, than the winning the gold medal itself. Um, I did strange things. I meditated in Samadhi tanks. I went on a commando course just uh, a week before the Olympic Games in Beijing, uh, which included climbing a 40-foot pole and then jumping off it uh, just to, to gain some sort of confidence. I never gained confidence from actually um, performing my sport, so I had to look at ways and areas outside of my sport to uh, to, to get better. I, um, yeah, every detail I, I looked into. I I got blood tests done, which looked at my uh, trace elements at the cellular level, uh, just to get a little bit better. I don't know if it helped. I got uh, from for mental training. I did something called neurofeedback training, which uh, I went to South Africa and. Uh, um, got my brain mapped, so I did 2,000 shots in a laboratory, shot 2,000 shots, and then they were able to see a pattern that when I was shooting good, my brain was functioning in a certain way, then I trained my brain to be in that zone more. Uh, but having said that, I did all of these things, and uh, the night before the Olympic Games, I was a nervous wreck. So at the end of the day, it all boiled down to courage, it all boiled down to determination, and that real will from within. I mean, you have to want it from deep within. And I think I had that for some time, and, and that, that to me was my, my biggest achievement. So, you know, Abhinav, you've described yourself as a shooter, as swatter, he calls himself. And he's been describing to you some of the swatting that he did, you know, the keen analysis, the, the microscopic attention to detail. And yet the first, uh, you know, you've, you've spoken about the Athens uh, Olympics as perhaps the biggest milestone in your life. It really changed you as a person, the defeat, and yet you, you performed very well there and you still lost. Can you just tell the audience about that experience and what it did to you? And, and also the kind of irrationality of the sport then, you know? So uh, um, I went to the Athens Olympics and I really felt that I had a good chance. I qualified for the final after breaking an Olympic record. Um, and then I finished seventh. And a few days later after my final got over, they found out that the floor I was standing on was wobbly, it had a loose tile. So in a sport which required perfect stillness, I was pretty much standing on a trampoline. And that really broke my heart. I was, went into depression for a certain while and uh, um, it killed me. It, it, it really took a lot out of me to, 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 to get back at it. Um, but I think the one thing what it taught me was a sense of detachment. I got very detached from the outcome. Uh, and I went, when I went to Beijing, uh, I, could, I didn't care what I would, if I would win a medal or not. My job was to perform the best that I could on every single shot and be the best that I could be. If I managed to do that, 
it was victory on victory in itself, and that to me was the most important important thing. Winning the medal, I didn't. It was important, but it uh, it wasn't foremost in my mind at that moment. I was so detached from the outcome. Even I hardly smiled even after winning because because I knew that it was the difference between winning and not winning is so it's such a small margin and. The most you can ask for as an athlete is to, to prepare well, to, to be the best that you can be, not just once in four years, but every single day in those four years, and push yourself and prepare to the best of your ability, that you know that once going to the next Olympics, I knew that I had done everything that I humanly possibly could to prepare for the Olympic Games, and I'd already won before I was actually there. So that was, that was what Athens uh, taught me, and that's how I changed after the incidents in Athens. You know, that's beautifully put that you'd actually won before, already before you got there, Abhinav. And you've spoken again about how really being a shooter is like li living life by the decimal, you know. But uh, I'm going to come back to those high points, the moments of redemption. Before that, I'm sure a lot of us here are drawing our own personal lessons from your pursuit, you know, insights into ourselves and our own journeys. So I want to explore a little more about the psychology of, of what it took. You've spoken about fear, you've spoken about self-doubt, anxiety, uh, you know, you've spoken about stillness. There's an interesting thing that you've sh uh, spoken of in your book, Abhinav, that is before the Beijing elections, uh, elections, I'm saying, you can see Gujarat is on my mind. <laughs> um, before the actual uh, winning at Beijing, you almost forced yourself to shoot badly. Could you explain that extremely contrarian uh, approach to acquiring self-belief? I think the idea was to prepare in a way where you took every took, took care of every possible variable. Uh, so big, big, after Athens, I trained on a wobbly floor, for example, preparing for Beijing. It didn't matter to me if I had a wobbly floor or not. Uh, I was always a nervous wreck, so I knew that I wouldn't get much sleep before the Olympic Games. So I went. Uh, I forced myself not to sleep before competitions in preparation for Beijing. Uh, but I think one thing was important. I went. You you practiced not sleeping. You're yes. Saying. Yes. I, I stood awake the whole night. I hope all of you agree with me about the certified insanity of this. You know? <laughs> I, I, I didn't sleep the whole night and uh, um, yeah, I did. But I think the most important thing for me going into, Sorry, Abhinav, going into Beijing and all my other important competitions was that I had to be very hungry for success. I think if you're hungry and determined and you want it from deep within your gut, you can navigate every challenge that c comes forward and, and, and you can find a way through but you need to have it from, you need to want it from within. Uh, and if you have that, then you find a way because you want it, you need it. It's not just a want anymore that I want to win a medal. I needed to win that gold medal. And that's what made the difference uh, in my whole journey and in my whole pursuit. You know, uh, we've talked of it as a lonely pursuit. Uh, and as I said, I'm gonna come back to your victories, but I'm still interested in the process. Uh, you said that to be a winner, you need a team, you know, and that nobody can do this alone. Uh, also, I'm going to come back to the debacle of the Indian sporting establishment and how they absolutely don't know how to be a team, uh, team player. But would you share with us a little bit about your coaches, you know? What were the kind of people who walked with you through this journey? And what did they do to, to kind of uh, collapse who Abhinav Bindra was and reconstruct a new temperament, a new psychology that became the winner. You know, can you talk to us about them? So I worked with a set of coaches. I had two sets of coaches, completely different personalities. One set of coaches, they were a couple. I love them, I, I'm still in touch with them, and you know, I had a great relationship with them. And then there was another coach who probably helped me a lot, and that's probably the only person who I hate in my life. Uh, he always told me things I never wanted to hear. But I kept on, kept kept him on board because he always. Is that like just a rhetorical thing, or did no, you no, no, really no. dislike I him? I hate that man. I and I, I'm so stupid. I paid him money to make me cry, uh, uh, and uh, um, but he always taught, uh, told me things that I didn't want to hear. He always pointed out my weak points, uh, but I kept. I, I hope there are a lot of political people here, a lot of CEOs who are hearing that. You know, the dissenting voice, very important. <laughs> Yeah, so he always told me things I didn't want to hear. I, for example, there was a time when I'd worked a lot on my fitness and I went to a fitness test in Germany and I thought I did pretty well and I was all excited and this man comes to me and said, my grandmother's even more fitter than you are. Uh, 
Uh, and I mean, he, he, there was once he just left me in the rain in Germany. I had to walk five kilometers. There was no, uh, in, uh, there was no possibility to get any transport. But he had a, he had a way to get, uh, get my juices flowing and, and to get the best out of me. Uh, my other sets of coaches, Gabby and Heinz, they were, they're the kindest uh, people that I know in, in the world. So I think you need, a, you need a combination of both. I think there's a time, there was a time when I needed that kindness and I, there, was a, there was a time when I needed to be pushed and it was a combination that was important. Uh, and I think uh, that's what helped me. That's what kept me going and you know, even now that I'm retired, I'm still in touch with my coaches and in the little, the, 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 even the small decisions I have to take in life now, I still consult them and I value their opinion and you know, that's, the re that's a relationship that I will value for the rest of my life. Yes, the gold medal was great, but uh, um, you know, there's more to it. So Abhinav, uh, tell us a little about your competitors. You know, is there anybody who affected you deeply, who impacted you deeply? Do you have that kind of karmic relationship with one of your competitors? And what did you most fear in those people that you were competing with? I didn't fear them, I just hated them. Um, they were just better than me. <laughs> I was just jealous of them most of the time. Uh, um, yeah, I, I did not have too many friends on the shooting range. Uh, at least uh, none of my competitors were real, my real friends, no. In fact, you said that you had to train yourself to hate them as well. You're really the most unlikely sporting material that turned out the gold, I was this right? very soft kind of an indi individual. I, I was, as a child, I was never a competitor. Um, a certain part of me thinks that competition is stupid. I mean, um, but I had to, I was in a field where I, I needed that killer instinct, per se, to be successful. Uh, and I had to push myself to, to, to have that aggressivity, what is needed to, to win. Uh, and you need that. So that's fascinating, Abhinav. Everyone says that you are either born with it or you don't. Are you telling us today, and I'm sure again this will have a lot of resonance for people in their own context, that can you really engineer a killer instinct? Can, can you construct a killer instinct that you don't naturally possess? I thought... I think you can work on it. I think uh, uh, you have to work on it. You have to consciously work on it and you have to take help from others sometimes when you don't have it and you uh, need to... Uh, you need to try different things to, 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 to get there. You can't just be that laid back person, sit on your seat and hope that some things will happen. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you can just can keep waiting for the rest of your life. I mean, I had to actively work on it and that's what I did. My coaches were hard on me for, I'll give you an example. Um, the night before Beijing, I was, in the evening before Beijing, I was very calm. Uh, and my coach, Gabby, who was with me, actually, instilled panic into me and I had a panic attack after that because she thought that I was too calm and just being too calm is also not the best of things. You need a little bit of uh, anxiety and a little bit of that edge that is needed to be the best that you could be. So that evening she, she told me and made me all crazy and made me, yeah, there was this moment that I was like so calm and I was looking forward to my competition and then from, she just did something, she said something to me and uh, uh, said that tomorrow is the, comp tomorrow is the Olympic Games, you've trained your whole life for it and what are you going to do about it? And that just uh, switched triggered on, a triggered, a, triggered it, but it was important. It was important to, to, to get that going, to, to get the best out of myself. And I had, that huge, I had a huge panic attack that evening and uh, I didn't sleep. Uh, I have to confess, I know Glenn Levitt is one of your sponsors, but I have an interesting story. So I went to Beijing from, from Germany and uh, I'm not a big drinker or anything like that, but just as I was, checking out of my hotel room, I went to the mini bar and stole a bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> and I had it in my toilet kit. And that night when I couldn't sleep, I reached out to my little bottle of Jack Daniels. It didn't help me get much sleep, but it did help me win the gold medal the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, talking about Abhinav and everything that he's conquered, not being a fat boy, as he keeps saying, not having that killer instinct, not having the sporting temperament, not wanting to beat others, not wanting to win. You're truly a story in uh, you know, adversity. No. <laughs> but I just wanted to share with the audience that Abhinav also had imperfect eyesight, you know, and you overcame that as well. So, and he says a lot of people think he's a snob because nobody knew that you yeah. can't see other people. And I wanted to ask you, is that a metaphor for what is needed to be a sportsman, that you don't see others? 
or were you really not able to see others? So I, I, I used to have very bad vision. I had zero peripheral vision and that's not good for my sport because my sport requires a lot of balance and uh, peripheral vision is very, very important to, to get that sense of balance. Um, especially shooting in big, big facilities, you require those because you don't have any visual uh, points. Um, so I actually won the gold medal with very poor, poor eyesight. Uh, I could just focus on my target. And uh, post, the, post the games in Beijing, I went and had surgery to perfect my vision. And now I have very, very good p vision. But uh, post- I'm feeling very seen by you. <laughs> no, po post Beijing, I couldn't perform the way I could, could perform uh, pr uh, prior. Uh, because um, before, I, I could just focus on my target. I couldn't see on the left, I couldn't see on the right. When somebody walked past me, I just didn't acknowledge them because I didn't see them. And then I had this LASIK surgery done and I have perfect vision now and then I went, to, went into competition and I could see so many people. I could see people watching me and that was more panic. <laughs> and uh, I was trying to actually improve but it took a while to adapt and I think uh, that is something that sport teaches you as well, adaptability. You have to constantly learn to adapt because you're, you're, you're faced with challenges you never thought that would come up and you have to somehow find a way to, to uh, navigate those challenges and navigate them quickly. As I said, uh, you know, the oddity of this is that you spend a lifetime conquering fear, conquering panic, and then to win, you have to trigger a panic attack, you know? So that really talks about the unpredictability of life. Um, Abhinav, so two things before we move to uh, Rio de Janeiro is that You've, we've spoken about the science, we've spoken about the obsession, the, you know, what it took to become uh, what you have become. But what was it like to get, a, you know, to get epilepsy, to be afflicted with epilepsy, which is literally the antithesis of what you need to be a shooter, uh, to be still, and to still conquer that? Can you share that journey with us? What did it take? What did it do to you? Uh, and then we'll come to the redemptions. So I was diagnosed with it. I think a couple of years before the games in Rio. And it was a huge setback for me personally, initially, and because you know, this is a sport of stillness, my, my, my epilepsy got actually uh, tremors in my hand, and you, know, you need to be still to trigger, and, you know, um, and I had this shaky hand, and suddenly I had to find a way to, to overcome it. But my sport helped me. My sport got me, um, forced me to re relearn. It, it, it taught me motor skills, and it was my refuge. Uh, because it forced me to, yeah, it fo got me focus, it got me direction, uh, and um, it actually helped me, you know, in a, in a way, because it learned, I, I, for did a while... You, did you have a slump when you found out you have epilepsy? What made you get up again and say, I'll be a shooter again, you know, with yeah, something... I, so I had a slump, but I didn't give up. I, 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 I didn't want to sit back and self-pity. I wanted to find a way to get past it, and I wanted to find a solution. Uh, and that was that was that was been my attitude all my life, and that's what. When I was faced with this challenge, I wanted to find a way through. I went to the best doctors in the world, tried to find ways to improve. Uh, and going into Rio, I I, I was okay. Uh, I ended up fourth in Rio, uh, one tenth of a point away from a me possible medal. Uh, but I finished fourth uh, at Rio not because of uh, because of epilepsy or, be or because of a tremoring hand. I finished fourth in uh, Rio because I wasn't good enough for third. So I don't use, didn't ever use that as a, as a reason for, of why I did not medal. I'm, of course, extremely proud of what I did in Rio because I was faced with a personal challenge, a, a personal challenge that I had to overcome. Um, um, and to me, it was uh, winning in Beijing was great, but I think personally for me, Rio was very, very satisfying. It, it, it gave me great closure to my career. Uh, because I did not give up, I did not sit back in self-pity, I worked hard to find a way through the challenge that came my way and I found a way to be fourth best in the world. Avnav, uh, it's incredible actually that journey, again just to really share with the audience the awe of what you have accomplished, will you, will you share, tell us what the medicines for epilepsy did to your body and to your mind and you know just Help us understand the full arc of what you uh, overcame. Yeah, the side effects were exactly what I didn't need for my sport. Uh, I had double vision, I, I lost a sense of balance, uh, I felt sleepy and lethargic the whole day, but I got used to nausea, but I got used to it. And uh, 
it took a while and, and then you just but found a way. When you actually went to Rio, had you overcome those symptoms yeah. or were you adapting with those symptoms? No, when I went to Rio, I was fine. As I said, I, 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 when I went to Rio, I was in a good shape. I was in a very good shape. Uh, but leading up to it, I, I had challenges. I went to the 2014 Commonwealth Games in, in Glasgow. Uh, I won the gold medal and uh, there were moments where I didn't know if I... I think the day before the, the competition in Glasgow, I was so disoriented, I couldn't actually pack my bag. Uh, my coach, Heinz, was with me and he actually had to help me pack my bag because I was so disoriented because of the medication. But uh, it just helped me. In a way, it was a blessing in disguise because I just had to live it moment to moment. And I, I learned, it taught me how to just focus on the moment. I, I didn't have the energy or the resources to look back or to look so much uh, ahead. I just was try to make the best of every moment, one shot at a time, and uh, that's what I tried to do, and I was, I, yeah, I found a way through. I don't know how, but I somehow did it. So I'm, um, okay, so before we uh, wrap one quick, just describe to us that moment in Beijing when you won the gold, you know? Uh, was that really the moment, the, the peak? You've spoken of Rio being very important to you. But was Beijing, was winning that holy grail finally as redemptive uh, a feeling as it should have been? I think it brought me, a, it was a great sense of satisfaction. I think uh, that was my biggest emotion that I had satisfaction. Um, yeah, the satisfaction that I'd put my life, blood and soul into this whole endeavor and that I succeeded, somehow found a way to succeed. Thank you very, very much, Abhinav. Um, you know, just a, a couple more things that Abhinav has spoken in the book, which I really urge all of you to buy because it's, it's a very, very riveting read, a very psychological uh, you know, analysis of what it takes to be an excellent sportsman. But uh, he's also spoken you know, about this moment in Beijing that he didn't even really smile. He had to get footage to remember whether he smiled when he won the gold. And that ultimately when he thought about it, he felt that it was the practice, it was being on the range, just being in competition with the sport, that was his greatest redemption. Uh, throughout his life. And there's another fascinating takeaway was that he said he often kept a mirror in his pocket because his coaches had told him that uh, the look is everything and that when you go into competition, you should look like you're calm and if you look, if your face is anxietal, then you'll feel anxietal. So there was all of that as well uh, in making what we cherish today as India's first gold Olympic medal solo. And thank you very, very much for sharing with us, Abhinav, both the excruciating journey and the redemption. Thank you. Thank you.